Hello and welcome to session two, Embodied Sound of the More Than Sound Exploring Contemporary Themes in Sound Studies Symposium. Just a quick note um, to those of you that have joined the Zoom room for Kath Clover's interactive um, sing-along. That's not actually starting until around 1.40 and for your best viewing experience of the rest of the symposium, you're better off being in the YouTube, watching the YouTube channel and then switching at 1.40. So my name is Tessa Laird and I'm a lecturer in critical and theoretical studies at VCA Art in the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to thank Jordan Lacey first for organising this symposium and secondly for performing an acknowledgement of country that so beautifully set the tone for today's discussions. And I'd like to add my heartfelt acknowledgement from Wurundjeri country, from the land referred to by William Barrack as Bulekbek or flat land with scattered trees, today known as Brunswick. And I wanna pay my respects to elders past and present on what was, is, and will always be Aboriginal land. It's a rainy day in Pornit or tadpole season, and I couldn't think of a better day to be stuck inside staring at a screen. So good choice, Jordan. This panel has been given the title Embodied Sound, but we want to make it clear that when thinking of the body or the embodied, we're thinking with the more than human, again, which Jordan defined so eloquently this morning. Specifically in this panel, we want discussions around and about sound to encompass not only our own embodied sensoria, but also the gamut of sensing or sensible life on this planet. As the panel convener, I want to begin with the caveat that I'm in no way an expert in the field of sound or sound art. However, my interests do encompass the more than human, more specifically, the interdisciplinary field of animal studies and its various entanglements with visual arts practices. And when I say visual arts, I'm sure that most of you will know that these days, so-called visual artists are just as likely to be working with text, performance, film or sound as they are with traditional visual modalities. And I have two artists with me here today, Nori Newmark and Kath Clover, whose work encompasses a range of practices, including sound, performance, and video. Added to that, Nori is the author of the influential book, Voice Tracks, Attuning to Voice in Media and the Arts, which was published by the MIT Press in 2017. And I found that book incredibly helpful in thinking through sound, or voice, as Nori prefers, as a more than human attribute. Nori writes, specifying voice rather than sound or music allows a foregrounding of otherness and relationality and with them of ethics and politics. Nori's examples of voicings in the book are numerous and include a vomiting cat, screaming yes, yes, again, as Caleb referred to earlier, a house that speaks three languages, piles of rice in a rice factory, the voice of a bridge, and even the very air we breathe. She writes, voice calls out, calling upon others to listen, to think. This is not a call constructed by the listener, human or otherwise, but a call from, a call upon, a call to, a call that affects and effects. It is a call of vitality, of life. And I think that perfectly sums up a more than human approach to sound. Coincidentally, Voice Tracks also discusses the art practice of Kath Clover, as Nori describes her delight at witnessing Kath's 2014 work, Reading the Birds, in which Kath read Daphne du Maurier's short story, At Dusk, to a tree full of roosting urban birds noisily settling in for the night. Nori describes the work as a relation between birds, reader, audiences, and text that was taking place. For Nori, reading the birds presented itself as an assemblage, a provisional and informal coming together and a doing together of artist, birds, audience, tree, place. Before I was introduced to Kath's Reading the Birds and Voice Tracts, I'd already experienced Kath's work when we were both curated into a Liquid Architecture performance night as part of their series, Why Listen to Animals, in 2016. 
This particular event was called Listening Across the Abyss of Incomprehension. My performance lecture presented snippets of the manuscript I was working on at the time towards A Cultural History of Bats, which was published by Reaction in 2018. I was joined by sound artist James Grant, who produced electronic echolocation sounds while my image was projected upside down or right way up, according to most bats. Cat's performance was a cacophony of text and sound, including an overhead projector layered with avian wordings, Peter Knight's piercing trumpet, and recordings of caged tropical birds. A couple of years later, after my bat book was published, Kath asked my permission to read excerpts from the book to the flying foxes who camp at the Yarraben Park. Her voice reading my words and the chattering of bats knotted and meshed to become the sound work Speaking in Tongues 2019, which was part of an exhibition about animal communication at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. I guess what I'm trying to say is that Nori, Kath and I are already as entangled as the worms which feature in Nori's thinking and making, particularly in the work Waiting by Out of Sync, the duo made up of Nori and her longtime collaborator, Maria Miranda. And we'll see this work shortly. The entanglements Nori, Kath and I weave, like those of the worms, are productive, slippery and fun all at the same time, but they also demonstrate commitment and a kind of persistence to stick with the knotty issues of cohabitation on this multiplicitous planet and specifically to do so through sonic attentiveness and what Nori refers to as attunement. So to give you an overview of this session, after I've more formally introduced Nori, we'll begin with the out of sync video waiting, then Nori will take the floor and then I'll introduce Kath and then Kath will lead you through what she calls a sing-along. So, without further ado, Nori Newmark is a sound and media artist and a theorist and writer on sound, voice, affect, art and media. Her current passions are human-animal relations, environmental concerns and voice, and helping to set up a community garden in her local neighbourhood. I've already discussed her pivotal work, Voice Tracks, but she was also lead editor and contributor to the earlier MIT press book, Voice, Vocal Aesthetics and Digital Arts and Media, and she's the founding editor of Unlikely Journal for Creative Arts. The 2016 video Waiting is a collaborative artwork co-composed by Out of Sync, that is Nora Newmark and Maria Miranda, and Worms. Waiting was initially made for more art to be exhibited in a railway waiting room. The artists put microphones inside worm cafes and amplified the worms' voices for the video. In this composting collaboration, Nori and Maria feed the worms what they are eating and the worms transform dead matter into live soil, providing their human collaborators with castings and with food for thought.
Squish, squelch, slurp. The nearly inaudible, more than sound of warming compost. It's more than human voice. As rotting compost and wriggling worms speak, they arouse human bodily affects. These human bodily affects in turn sound out, voicing themselves. Some people recoil with abject disgust, gasping their deathly horror. Others are joyfully lured closer, humming their connection, while still others simply turn away in numbed indifference, harumphing their diffidence. In this presentation, I will work with new materialism, critical animal studies, and sound theory to listen to wormy composts more than human voice, a sound calling out for a response as it evokes human affects. I ask, how do the more than human embodied voices of rotting compost and wriggling worms stir affects in their human listeners? As I remember and respond to the affective lure of wormy compost's voices, I'm provoked too to reconsider broader aesthetic and political understandings of human, more than human relations. Squish, squelch, slurp. The voices of wormy compost, embodiment, affect, and more than sound. Before I go on, I'd like to thank Tessa for the amazing, generous introduction. I also want to add my own acknowledgement of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung unceded lands I speak from and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'm excited to be part of this amazing event and want to thank Jordan for inviting me. Inclining in. Let me begin by stating my inclinations. I am a compost devotee and a worm lover. I incline to listen joyfully to their nearly inaudible more than sound, their voices, voices that move me affectively as they lure me in. This is a literal, bodily, and embodied affective and sonic inclination. As a sound artist, I'm inclined to listen and respond through my work. An urge to make audible a listening to worms was one of the political and ethical concerns grounding the worm project I developed with artist collaborator Maria Miranda a number of years ago, a part of which is playing behind me or next to me. Alongside the worms themselves, we were inspired by Vincien Desprez's understanding of human, non-human animal relations as a mutual attunement, a vital, passionate, bodily withness. For Desprez, such relations of attunement depend on the availability of bodies to each other, to practices that transform both, to affects that move them. To burrow into this entombment, we wanted to collaborate with worms. We decided on a durational artwork during which, as we fed the worms, they transformed dead matter into live soil and into compost. We began the project soon after we had moved from an apartment in Sydney to a house in Narm, Melbourne, where for the first time we had a backyard, vegetable patches and a worm cafe. We hadn't thought about worms before, but we were quickly enchanted. The more we fed them, the more fascinated we became. We discovered shared passions like the love of coffee, which animated us all. Ah, surge of coffee high for those of you who share this. We were further drawn in to work with worms when we sensed an affinity between our commitment to recycling and their compost, composting transformational skills. We felt moved by a strange but intimate embodied connection to the earthworms, little critters who are so vital to everyday life and to the existence of humans, non-humans, the soil, the earth. Critters who are normally overlooked in the background, even despised, but who for us evoked joy. Yes. As for many artists, a crucial question presented itself before we began the project. 
how to work with non-human animals ethically and politically, as well as aesthetically, in ways that don't exploit their vulnerability. How, in other words, to collaborate with them rather than using them or putting them on display. We decided to try to attune to the worms through listening to their voices, to let their moving voices provoke our own affective voices. Through the headphones attached to a microphone in the worm cafe, we listened, letting our bodies and voices amplify their voices. They said, we responded. During the project, I was struck by Charles Darwin's recognition of worms, intelligence, creativity, and sociability. He said, they perhaps have a trace of social feeling, for they are not disturbed by crawling over each other's bodies, and sometimes they lie in contact. Before I had attuned to worms and their social feeling, I would have cringed at this image, crawling, slimy, creepy, irk. But now I feel differently, affectively and sonically. Now, when I lean in to listen, I apprehend an alluring voice, a voice co-composed of the whirring coffee machine that grinds the morning coffee we share, the crunching toast we are all munching, the slurping food as it goes into the compost. Together, voicing an assemblage that calls me to listen to what an art collaboration with worms might be and might say, ah, yes. Inclining in. Political philosopher Jacques Rancière understands the aesthetic political implications of affective voices, sorry, affective forces which move bodies. For him, it is the affective force that is the aesthetic force of art, in the sense that aesthetics makes the inaudible audible and the invisible visible. For Ranciere, aesthetics reveals the common sense regime of the senses upon which the givenness and habits of our society rest. This is what makes art inherently political, since the social, cultural, and political status quo operates through that invisibility and inaudibility. Through its affective force, then, art can make us notice things that we have come to take for granted, things we have become accustomed to not noticing, things we have learned to not notice or not to notice, and even, I would add, to deny. Art can disturb our habits, throwing daily life and its grounding into relief, and thus, opening, and thus opens new ways to think about what we do says Ranciere. Things we feel affectively but don't register, consciously or intellectually, these are the ground that art can work on ethically and politically to motivate recognition, response, and or refusal or denial. For the artist, as well as for audiences, as artists, Maria and I were interested in this sort of political ethical ethical and aesthetic foregrounding, foregrounding critters and effective relationships which are usually unnoticed, though not unfelt nor unspoken, in the background. We hope that these small sounds, theirs and ours, might stir others too. We hope these voices might motivate a response to pervasive anthropocentric exploitation of vulnerable non-human animals expressing our fundamental entanglements. Entanglements, hmm, entanglements. A tricky figure, much like that other slippery one, becoming animal. Despite some reservations, I'm attracted to philosopher Christoph Cox, Cox with his proposition that becoming animal is an entering into, should I say worming into, a shared affective and productive zone to experience common capacities with non-human animals rather than imitating their forms. And in this movement, Cox explains, quote, we can unlearn physical and emotional habits and learn to take on new ones, end of quote, to experience new physicalities, new emotions, 
and new relations with others and with the world. Perhaps in this way, Cox helps rescue becoming animal from what feminist scholar Donna Haraway criticizes as Deleuze and Guattari's, I'll quote, disdain for the daily, the ordinary, the affectual, rather than the sublime, end of quote. And what could be more daily and ordinary than worms as we work together, connected sonically by this affect and affection? As the worms agree, as they insist, the ordinary is not to be ignored. Chiming here with anthropologist Kathleen Stewart, in her own forceful writing on ordinary affects, Stewart speculates on the imminent force of complex and uncertain objects that fascinate because they literally hit us or exert a pull on us. Ordinary affect is a surging, a rubbing, a connection of some kind that has impact, she says. Like becoming animal, entanglement is also an appealing figure for many in animal studies. However, for some, it risks occluding many painful human, non-human animal relations that we don't hear or that we deny. Paula Arcari, Fiona proben Rapsi, and Haley Singer, for instance, have critiqued entanglement as a celebratory, romanticizing, and inadequately politicized figure. They argue that it distracts researchers from a critical awareness of the instrumentalizing and commodifying relations from which so many human, so many non-human animals suffer. They say, quote, in contrast to the ethos of multi-species entanglement and becoming with that typically animates this research, large numbers of animals entangled in the machinations of our city constitute a nature that remains mostly unseen, end of quote. Reading their critique, I sense that while the figure of entanglement might direct us to listen to how a lamb in a petting zoo bleats joy for the child who leans in to pet it, the concept doesn't necessarily attune us to the pitiful but unpitied cries of the lambs in the, laboratory, in the abattoir, that are not heard or felt by that child. Nonetheless, as I watch worms intertwining with each other and as I respond affectively and sonically, I do feel a pull which feels like entanglement, feeling inescapably entwined and connected at the same time as other. And I wonder if the figure of entanglement might still have useful conceptual force making us notice an intense otherness, an otherness that calls out to us affectively for response. I wonder particularly if worms and their composty entanglements might open our senses and bodies to other unfamiliar relations. As philosopher and artist Eva Mayer reminds us, writing about what she calls worm politics, it is, quote, problematic to only focus on those animals who are most like us. Because earthworms are so different to humans and because we know little about them, our relations with them do raise many questions. And one of these questions is about affective entanglements and knowledge, the knowledge power relations that help shape and are shaped by those affects. As I think about Foucaultian knowledge power and affect, I'm painfully reminded of a disturbing event that haunts me still. I retell this story inspired by Kathleen Stewart's speculative writing that recognizes, she says, how, me how moving forces are imminent in scenes, subjects, and encounters. The event occurred during the launch in my local park of Kathy Coloco's statue of a giant golden earthworm, unsung hero, it was called. The launch included a worm party at which the Gould League promised a free worm composting session and information stall. But as it turned out, it was not much of a party for real life worms. 
I recall going over to check out the stall and recoiling as children were encouraged to poke and prod worms in the name of science and education. I felt my chest tighten, my body hot with anger, itching to explode in a rant about the cruelty. No. I tried to reason, struggling to constrain my voice as I alerted her to the cruelty to which the children were being incited. But I couldn't keep my emotion from my rising voice, to which the stall holder responded testily, that's how children learn. I could barely restrain from poking and prodding her myself with the justification, I'm just trying to learn about science and education. Harumph. But in respect to Kathy Coloco, I did refrain from creating a scene, even though I was deeply dejected by an educator's prodding children to poke those vulnerable worms. This was, after all, a launch of a statue in honor of earthworms, a statue that put an earthworm on a pedestal to be admired, not to be touched or touchable, and certainly not to be assaulted in the name of learning. It was meant to be an event to honour the worm and teach about ethical, caring, composting. Now, remembering this event, this incident, I feel the affect yet again, the anger shaking my body as it is assaulted by the hard, moral tone of big science amplifying that woman's voice. And once more, I find myself voicing no to the human exceptionalism that would assert its right to extract knowledge from non-human animals' vulnerable bodies. Squish, squelch, it's still life. Encountering wormy compost. Still life, for Kathleen Stewart, is a forceful, pulsing figure of intensity. A still life is a static state filled with vibratory motion or resonance, a quivering in the stability of a category or a tra trajectory it gives the ordinary the charge of an unfolding, she says. For me, this still life speaks of and speaks in wormy compost. Squish, squelch. The nearly inaudible sounds, more than sounds, of the ordinary and extraordinary processes of compost decomposition, fermentation, rotting, digestion and the joyful sounds of those who respond to their lure. Ah, oh, yes. This is what led Maria and me to begin a sound artwork, which we call It's Still Life. For that project, we recorded the responses to compost by neighbouring community gardeners. We asked them to gently dig into the compost, to turn it, to listen to its squitch-squelch voice, and to describe their affective responses as they did so. I love compost. Yeah. I do like that earthy smell and I kind of yeah, I like the I mean it does only good things. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. Oh, I love it. It's a complex relationship. Does it feel alive to you? Yes, very. And compost? Lovely. Very. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Alive. <laughs> but the, compost doesn't make me feel different about anything because okay. compost feels right. It's just real. Uh, compost is the most so real thing. I feel anything, connected just... to everything. Ah, oh, beautiful worms. It's a casual relationship. Worms have always been there for me and I uh, try to be there for worms. I rely on worms. They're our little them. heroes. Personally, I don't give them a lot of thought, but I like them. Ah, oh. a lot of corn cobs and parsley. A little bit of bread Oops. down there. Yep, we got We've oranges, got bread, um, yeah, some avocados, some like like stumps, some bok choy there, there some coriander. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit of mold happening. You can really see what your neighbours are eating. Yes. <laughs> the moment in our um, beauty shop. I was wondering who is yeah. eating so much avocado. Yeah. I think yeah. I, so yes, this is kind of very intimate. Mm. sensed in their voices, attuning to the still life that is wormy compost, was an intense and intimate affective counter with liminality, life and death, 
life in death. With its nearly inaudible sound of the co-mingling worms, who find life in compost and give it life, the compost moved many to express wonder and delight. Ah, uh, yes. Though I do admit, admit, repelling others with the quivering horror of death and decay. Ooh, no. It's alchemical, one of the gardeners said. I was lured in by this, by the alchemical doing thinking that, disrupt, that disrupts the seemingly unquestionable primacy of modern science. This is the modern science which presumes that animals belong to them as their proper subjects, as Elspeth Proben Rapsi once put it. And this is the very science that justified the education into human exceptionalism that arrogantly disturbed the singular specific vulnerable, vulnerable beings at the worm party. With a new materialist approach, theorist Jane Bennett has also been lured in by alchemy and its enchanting affects. Writing of the alchemist Paracelsus, she discerned, and I quote, for him, enchantment is not only a property of the natural world, it is also the joyful human mood that results from a special way of engaging the world. Enchantment as a mood requires a cultivated form of perception, a discerning and meticulous attentiveness to the singular specificity of things, end quote. By the way, Bennett recognized how listening or eavesdropping is crucial to alchemical practice, a more than sound practice, we might say. Which brings me back finally to the question of listening and care, sound and ethics. Jane Bennett, again, is one who understands that generous and ethical behavior to others, human and more than human, needs a motivating energy, an affective energy. Such an energy can come, she proposes, from enchantment. And again, I quote, enchantment is a peculiar kind of mood often induced by sound, the chant in enchantment. To be enchanted is to be both charmed and disturbed, charmed by a fascinating repetition of sounds or images, disturbed to find that although your sense perception has become intensified, your background sense of order has flown out the door. End of quote. With the affect of enchantment of wormy compost, then, there is an intense embodied sonic force, a force that may be alluring or repelling, as we attune to its more than sound, its more than human voice. Yes, no, slurp. Thank you. Love indeed. Thank you so much, Nori. That was so fascinating and thought-provoking and challenging. Um, and yet you still maintained a profoundly joyful sense of responsibility. Um, if people can save any questions for Nori until the end of the session, that would be great. And I'd like to introduce Kath Clover now. Um, to do so, I'm going to crib again from Nori's voice tracks. And while I'm reading this, um, for those of you that do want to join Kath's sing-along, you'll see there's that Zoom link in the chat. You might want to pop over there now and join that Zoom meeting. So Nori writes, Catherine Clover has been making works for and with noisy, wild, urban birds for many years, listening, recording, translating, transcribing, reading to them, performing for and with and after them, making books and performances and installations. Clover seeks artistic practices and ways to develop relationships of attunement with the birds. Her choice of urban gulls and pigeons is deliberately not sentimental. Instead of beautiful and mellifluous or even sublime birds calling us, calling to us from the wild, she works in a minor mode with despised and everyday species. Clover's mode is collaborative with human performers and with avian collaborators. Her human collaborators perform and improvise the written word, which includes her own translations and transcriptions of birds' voices. 
Clover works with listening as a way of becoming aware of sharing space and intertwining lives and voices in urban spaces, becoming aware of what we have in common with cohabitants in urban contexts. As Kath says of her work, her concern is to unlearn her old ways of listening in order to hear the birds' calls, not as pleasant musical sounds, nor even as the sound of a species, but as distinct communication between individuals living their lives in close proximity to mine. Okay, thank you and hello everyone. Thank you, Tessa, and thank you, Nori. Um, fascinating and a, a wonderful intro to for me to follow on from. Now, some of you will have accessed the Zoom already to participate um, a little later, and I will prompt you again for those of you who'd like to uh, uh, participate as well. So um, I'm going to introduce a few ideas first as context for thinking about um, what we're doing here, and, um, and then I'll mention the Zoom link again. Uh, yes, yeah, so firstly, I will introduce the uh, context. Um, there are also four scores to access on the website, which um, are also in linked near the Zoom link through the schedules. So you may want to access those as well. They will also be in this PowerPoint as well, though. So I'll go through the four scores and give vocal demonstrations of how you can voice or sound them. Then we will have some warm up exercises so you can get used to hearing your own voice with everyone else's. And finally, when we do the voicing together, you can choose a single score to sound or have a go at all four. There are four scores and we'll aim to spend about five minutes voicing together. See how we go. So. Um, Simon, Ari and Edward have been our amazing technical crew on this and they'll be guiding us through the setup. There may be some glitches and technical hitches, but I don't think this is a problem. We'll do our best and see what happens. I haven't done a participatory voicing online before, so it is a first for me and looking forward to seeing how it all pans out. OK, so the contextual ideas to this voicing. The work addresses the relationship between humans and birds, specifically wild, urban, noisy songbirds, both native to Australia and introduced. Humans have relationships with birds across all cultures. So these ideas resonate cross-culturally and across the globe. We are all familiar with birds. However, the relationship is often difficult, troubling and exploitative with birds suffering from the impact of human behavior in many ways. Here in Australia, we can learn a lot from the indigenous relationship with birds. Indigenous Australians do not conceive of a divide between humans and nature. There is no separation. Humans are understood to be an integral part of all things. As humans, we are not separate and we are not superior. I have found that Donna Haraway's term nature cultures is a way of interpreting and identifying this inclusive idea for non-Indigenous people. This idea of connection to all species, to the world that we live in. To enact or embody nature cultures, as I understand it, Haraway has expanded on what or who kin might be. Kin are not just family members or blood relatives. She says, and I quote, kin is an assembling sort of word. All critters share a common flesh and ancestors turn out to be very interesting strangers. Kin are unfamiliar, uncanny, haunting, active. Birds are particularly important and symbolic to all the tribal groups of the Kulin nations of South Central Victoria. For the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of this part of Melbourne, where the symposium is taking place, Bunjil is their creator, the ancestral wedge-tailed eagle, and Wa is their protector, the ancestral crow. 
Wurundjeri custodian and linguist Mandy Nicholson explains that her traditional lands are still present and perceptible beneath the intense urbanisation of Melbourne. Uh, next slide, please, Ari. Mandy says, and I quote, as a traditional custodian of the greater Melbourne area, I do not see the buildings or the concrete. I see what is beneath, in and above. The six layers of Wurundjeri country include the Beek Ut, or below country, where we get our ochre from to decorate our bodies for ceremony and dance. The second layer is Beek Dui, on country, where we walk, dance and conduct ceremony. The third layer is Banj Beek, or water country, which sustains all life. All the rivers, creeks, raindrops, mist and dew are included in this layer. The fourth layer is Mernmut Beak, wind country. This layer is important as the wind allows the smoke from welcoming fires and the language you speak and sing to transcend up to Bunjil. The fifth layer is Waru Waru Beak, sky country. This is where the physical form of our creator Bunjil, the eagle, and his helper, Wa, the raven, can be seen. The fifth, sorry, the sixth and final layer is Tharangalk Beak, forest country above the clouds, and is Bunjil's home. End quote. Listening plays a key role in my art practice, and a core concept that drives how listening informs my practice is unlearning. I use listening to unlearn, to unlearn ways of knowing and or being in the world, to unpick typical Western knowledge hierarchies. As a white British woman living in Melbourne, Australia, I am trying to unlearn ways of being that my upbringing, education and experience of the world may have taught me to consider normalised. I position the process as unlearning rather than learning because this word helps me to understand that I may not have the right to know things, to know something to know different things, or even to know anything. Usually, I start these participatory voicings with a sound or listening walk, and this was the plan for today. But alas, alack, we are in a pandemic, and we are in lockdown in Melbourne. If we were outside, outdoors, listening to the city, some of the birds you would be able to hear would be the songbirds in these scores. Uh, next slide, please, Ari. The birds are Yanguk, or red bottle bird, Barawan, or Australian magpie. The translation to Woiwurrung was kindly provided by Wurundjeri elder, Auntie Gail Smith. These birds are native to Australia and they are both songbirds. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have House Sparrow, who arrived in Melbourne around 1862, and Common Starling, who arrived in Melbourne 1857 and Sydney 1877. These birds are also songbirds and were introduced to Australia in these decades, between roughly the 1860s to the 1880s. This participatory voicing is part of an ongoing project that considers what the sonic meeting point of the native and introduced birds may have been, and how it may continue to be unfolding in Melbourne today in 2021. Songbirds learn their songs and languages from their parents, just as we do. This means that their vocal sounds remain adaptable throughout their lives, and they can easily learn new ones, just like us. 
also like us. Songbirds have accents and dialects that connect their voices to location and place. These four birds are common birds in Melbourne, easily heard and readily seen. It would have been challenging for both of the introduced birds to identify their sonic niche or bandwidth in the biophony, the sound of all living organisms in a particular environment or biome. Yet both House Sparrow, with their repeated, quite unremarkable songs, and Common Starling, with their complex singing, have managed to find bandwidths that they can sonically occupy amongst the native birds of southeastern Australia. With Yanguk, Barawan, House Sparrow and Common Starling in our minds and in our mouths, this voicing is about opening a space for these common birds as potential kin, a voicing as kin making. Vinciane Despre suggests that the era we are living in could be labelled the phonocene, an era of sound, of song, an era of listening, and delightfully for my interests, she uses birdsong as the sounds and voices that have stimulated this direction of her thinking. She suggests we can, and I quote, think of the world as a place where anything can be sung and all the power of these songs can be felt. These are stories that invite us to rethink our era. With the contribution of you all, it is possible, perhaps, to consider the sonic meeting point of these birds from an embodied perspective, a materiality, a concrete sense of our physical selves as we contemplate their songs, the songs of the birds, through our breathing and our voicing. This participatory, patri, sorry, this participatory voicing is not about skill or expertise. It is not about training or ability. It is not about mastery, proficiency, accomplishment, competence. But it is about joining in and doing something together. I am not trained in performance or singing, and this is audible in my own delivery. So I hope this encourages you all to join in and have a go. Uh, next slide, please, Ari. Here is the first score from Yanguk, Red Wattlebird. Yanguk has a rhythmic, raucous call. The sounds are machine-like, mechanical, if you like, uh, raw and glitchy. The quality of their sounds is not conveyed effectively using the written word, of course, and writing the birds' voices in this way is not a functional process, and it does not deliver a translation of their voices. It is a process that struggles to render the birds' voices and often fails, but not completely. What is captured, as you can see from the score, is duration, rhythm, and structure, particularly useful for Yanguk's voice. I'll give you a quick example of how you might choose to voice this score. I do not sound like Yanguk, but I can approximate the rhythm and structure of the song. So some of you uh, familiar with Yanguk may recognise that rhythm and that sort of repetition, especially first thing in the morning at the moment in spring in Melbourne, where they're singing loudly outside our windows at about sort of 5.30 in the morning. Uh, next slide, please, Ari. Now, Barawan, or Australian magpie, this is quite a difficult song for us to attempt as humans. Barawan sing beautiful, complex, fluted melodies. Their songs seem to be highly improvised, but there is also structure, and song samples can be repeated several times. To try and sing Barawan is not easy, 
especially as each note forms a chord of about three sounds. But there are several components that are a little easier for the human voice. The first line, for example, is a dropping whistle, dropping from high pitch to low pitch, which is something like ew, ew. Now, my voice is far too slow to even get close to sounding like Barawan, but it might, if it's sped up, if you sped up the recording, you know, it might be along the lines of Barawan. There is also at the end, you can see the dropping whistle again, and also a frequent call. There's a call in itself, but also occurs within song, which is ah, ia, ah, ia, ia, ia. Frequently, Barawans sing together, both male and female, and they sing what we might call duets. In Australia, most female songbirds sing. Okay, next score, please. Next slide, please, Ari. House Sparrow arrived 1862. Now, a much easier bird for us to try and copy. Um, the sparrow's song is a single repeated sound that hardly alters. It is the that we tend to use to generalize bird song. It is not particularly loud, but it is penetrating in its duration, and especially when large groups of sparrows sing together in the heat, say, or at dusk. It's quite an easy sound for us humans to produce. And finally, are we the next slide? Common starling. The starling song is very complex, a mix of melodies that form no particular structure. It seems to be completely improvised, um, complicated again for us to voice like Barawan, but some elements are doable. Starling also has the dropping whistle from high pitch to low pitch, as you can see here. But but in general, the Starling's voice is much higher pitched than Barawan. So that whistle could be That sound seems to um, occur in many of their songs. It's a very sort of um, common characteristic of Starlings. You can often recognize them from when you hear that sound. Um, one way of perhaps doing starling would be to actually whistle rather than try and voice these sounds because you might be able to get a higher pitch. I can't, I simply can't even reach the pitch of a common starling. So um, whistling. Um, yes, that's not particularly good. Please excuse me. Um, they also do a lot of different sounds as well, beat clicking, which could be like the ch -ch -ch -ch. we could uh, we can approximate that with sort of tongue clicks or lip smacks. So the mix that common starlings use is a wide range. So in fact, there's a lot of options, um, even though it's it's an incredibly complicated um, voice for us to uh, sing. Also. All these songs are, are generally much faster than the way humans usually speak, certainly speakers of English anyway. So, all of these sounds, of course, are absolutely relevant if you want to attempt the score of the um, common starling. Um, so an imaginative approach to the scores is also a good idea. And if you have a memory of the sounds, if you have those sounds in your head, you, can, you might find that easier to use than, than reading these scores. So remember that any sound you make is exactly right. There is no wrong sound in this participatory voicing. OK, so I think we will now move to the voicing. Um, I think most of you are accessing via Zoom, so you're ready to go. And um, we're going to start with some warm-ups, rehearsals, and then we'll jump in and I'll guide us all the way through. 
So firstly, some vocal warm-ups. We will make four sounds together. They will be These will be made on the out breath. We will all take an in breath and then make that sound on the out breath. For example, I am breathing in and breathing out. Oh. I will guide us through these exercises so that we are all in time with each other. Okay, so let us begin. Let us breathe in and on the out breath, oh, very good, last as long as you can, <laughs> and again, breathing in. And on the out breath, I'm hearing some coming through. Yeah, it's great. I'm hearing some coming and going, so um, that's good. And thirdly, We'll breathe in and on the out breath. Oh. And finally, we'll breathe in and on the out breath. Okay, great. <laughs> it sounds quite glitchy at my end. I'm not sure about yours, but that's good. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now we will choose a score each to go for the voicing. Now, um, hopefully you've all accessed the scores, but if not, we have got um, Yangguk up on the um, PowerPoint. So if you need to just use that score and it is one of the easier ones to voice. Um, I will be going through all of them. I'll just follow them all in some, I try and batter a minute per score. You may wish to follow me in that way, or you may wish to just go your own way. So I will start now. We should try and aim for about five minutes. Okay, I'll be starting with Yangguk. Yeah, yeah. 
impressed with your commitment to the to the uh, <laughs> to the job that's great so perhaps perhaps you had in mind you know whether the bird you were singing was native or introduced you may have considered how the birds we may the sounds rather that we may have met how they came up against each other touched skirted engaged or encountered each other and um through our voices, of course, we were engaging with the fourth layer of Wurundjeri country, Murnmut Beak or Wind Country. So thank you everyone for joining in. Much appreciated. Thanks to you all. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Kath, and thanks everyone that participated in that. That was a lot of fun, um, very much more than human. There were, I'm, I swear, there were some real birds in there, um, and lots of wonderful machinic glitches as well. Um, so to anyone that is still in that Zoom meeting, please log out and continue to watch the symposium on YouTube. And we're going to bring Nori and Kath um, back in, and then we're going to have a conversation and take your questions. Hello, both of you. Thanks so Hi, much Tessa. for your wonderful presentations. That was so much fun. Um, <laughs> so I'm keeping my eye out for questions, but uh, to start off with, I guess I would really like to ask, all these things came up well in your talk, Nora, you addressed specifically the problems of entanglement and then the problems of becoming animal, but also perhaps its potential as well. And one of the things you said that it isn't, well, you said something about common capacities rather than imitation. And I know that you're very careful with the word that you use. Um, you use the word amplify rather than mimic um, with the worms. And then with Kath as well, because, you know, we're sort of, we're doing this thing of playing at being birds or, or uh, offering our interpretation of birdsong. And yet I wonder what word you would choose rather than imitate. Um, do you have a term, a preferred term? And I and I, I was going to suggest translation, but then you said no to translation as well. So I gather that it's a very tricky thing to um, to sort of put your finger on in, in terms of what exactly it is that, that we're doing with these practices. So uh, maybe if you could start, Nori, and then, and then Kath, if you could uh, give your interpretation. Are you asking me what's happening with Cats. Yeah. Cats I, no, no, your own work and and your in particular your use of the term amplify rather than imitate. Hmm. I suppose it's a sense of not trying to be them or not trying to take over them, but trying to feel them. So I suppose amplify is a is a term that I use because it's a sense of I I hear the sound and it enters my body and it's like my body amplifies it and it comes out. So I suppose it's sort of about a bodily, like the body almost like an amplifier. And Kath? Um well, I guess um, I would use the, the, that word on learning that I was talking about as a sort of broad, a broad description of what seems to be occurring. It's the only thing I can really sort of pinpoint is that I'm unlearning what I might think, you know, in terms of, say, um, mimicking or... Um, approximating sound and I mean even interestingly uh, I actually have trouble with that idea that you use Nori of collaborating with the birds I don't use that term collaborating because I don't see it as a mutual agreement I, I see myself outside looking in trying to unlearn and you know maybe at some point in decades to come I might learn something but in this process, I'm unlearning what I think is happening. I, I guess that's how I would um, um, answer your question. Mm, that's nice. Um, one thing I wanted to, oh, did you have more to say, Nori? I just wanted to say, I really like Kath's, you know, figure or approach of unlearning. I mean, I think it's really powerful. And um, also that, you know, the idea that we, we don't have to know, we don't have to think that we can know the other. That's part of that, you know, the way she's, or the way you, Kath, have, you know, worked with unlearning as um, freeing us from the, the need to know, I, I think, is, is really great. Yeah, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and one other thing I wanted to ask, I can see we've got a question coming through now, but um, I just wanted to go back to the screaming yeast of the previous session and the discussion around that as, um, you know, the sort of discussion about, oh, that's anthropomorphizing and no, the yeast isn't actually screaming. I just wondered what the two of you would have to say about whether or not to use the term anthropomorphizing or whether or not to use it as a tool and, and whether or not you think the yeast is screaming or not. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't actually have a trouble, a problem with the word anthropomorphizing, but I don't happen to use it. I, I guess that's how, what I would say. I, I do tend to skirt around it. and um, But I think it can be a very useful access point. And um, it's, it's almost like a starting point uh, for considering mm -hmm. the more than human world. But I, I don't tend to use it. But I, I'm not anti at all. I think it's, it's, um, a, it's a really good... Um, way of starting to think along these lines, I, I guess that's what I would say. Mm. Mm. And Nori? I mean, I think early on there was this, you know, we're not supposed to anthropomorphize and that's a really bad thing to do and it's, you know, human-centred and, um, yeah, human-centric. I think there has been a bit, and I suppose I feel this myself, that, I mean, in a way, you can only speak from your position. So, um, you know, and following on from what I was saying about uh, in relation to cats on learning, you know, you can't completely know the other and you shouldn't want to know the other or presume to know the other. So in a sense, the sort of worry about anthropomorphizing can like, on the one hand, it's good to be point to the, you know, we shouldn't be so human-centric, but on the other hand, can stop us from, in a way, owning our own position. Hmm. Hmm, thanks. Um, the question here from Jordan, I'm struck by how performative this session has been compared to what the others will mostly be like. Does learning from other animals somehow require us to tune into our bodies and our voice? Is this part of humans changing in some way or perhaps learning how to behave differently? Mm, yes, I, I, I think so. I mean, I've, I find with my work that it has been drawn in this direction it's not I mean I'm not a singer and I'm not a performer I trained as a painter you know it's it's been very confronting for me to do all this performative stuff but the work is asking that and it seems to be a a sort of careful negotiation of what is is taking place and it seems to be appropriate mm, yeah yeah, I mean, I think I agree with Jordan. There is something about these, the things that we're concerned with. And when you're thinking about embodiment, that you do a, an embodied response to what you're thinking about. So I think if you, you know, our session is about embodiment and it's not surprising that our, our presentations are, embodied or more embodied or aware of embodiment or playing with embodiment performatively. Um, one of the things that seems really clear in both of your practices is that there's this humour as well, this element of humour. Um, and I just wonder if you wanted to talk about that as a sort of a way of effectively attuning Mm. I think that um, that's quite important, actually. I, there's a real ab absurdity to what I'm doing because it seems so ridiculous, but that's also very appealing. And also in terms of asking people to join in, because I'm not really a participant kind of person. I don't want to join in in things. It's like, oh, my God, no. But um, if, it's, if it's sort of low key, if the bar is, well, low, I suppose you could say, um, 
it's um, it is about humour. It is about absurdity. It is about um, drawing people in in that way, and more audiences are more likely to um, to come along and and come along for the ride, I suppose. Especially if you don't use that word, art. <laughs> <laughs> you know, humour is a great way, of a great leveller. And, um, and yeah, so, so a lot of my work, for example, is public art, where there isn't that context in which you, you feel obliged to operate. Um, there is no apparent context, so um, except for the, the outdoors, generally the urban. So um, I do find it a very useful, um, significant component, actually, of uh, the work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I think we don't necessarily set out to be funny. Um, I think sometimes <laughs> this happens. I'm not sure why, and I'd be interested to hear from you, Tessa, why you think that it does happen. But I mean, I do think I find humor is a way into works that can be difficult or ideas that are difficult or not familiar. So, I mean, I think humour is, you know, it can shift the ground a bit, make it, you know, more available. I mean, I think, you know, say with that video, the um, where we were amplifying the worm sound, you know, it's painful for us to look at it. I mean, other people laugh, which I think is a relief, but for us to look at ourselves up there is painful, but I think we decided it's better for us to endure the pain than to, you know, make the worms endure pain by being put on display. Oh, anyway, I'm curious. I'm curious what you think, Tessa, about humour. Well, I think when I'm watching, say, you and Maria, and, and, you know, I do laugh because you're so, the two of you are so committed and earnest about it, and yet what is happening to your human bodies and your human voices is something which, um, you know, it doesn't make any sense in in the kind of the verbal lexicons that we have and 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 the kind of acceptable ways of 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 making sound in the everyday and um i think that the like as kath put it the absurdity of that there's something really charming about it and and it does speak to a commitment and it and it does um sort of imply that that you don't mind being made a fool of or or acting the fool in order to um, to in, in order to engender thinking differently about the more than human and I think it's it's brave and it's um it's quite it's it's really compelling but I think that when you laugh you do sort of you automatically um, you also are going through some sort of affective relationship and your body is changing in relation to that of another um, so perhaps that is a kind of um, a different way of engaging um, we've got this suggestion of the word following as a substitute for the word collaboration, um, which is nice, if anyone has any thoughts oh. on that. Yes, that's a nice word. I like it very much. Mm. I think that um, that's sort of in the Derrida, you know, the animal that therefore I am, because Je suis is uh, also I follow, and there is that kind of, you know, that idea of I follow the animal. Um, and Gordon asked, oh, no, sorry, this is from David Chesworth. Um, to Kath, I once heard a wax cylinder recording of a Yorta Yorta elder singing a song that mimicked a bird. Do you have any thoughts on the differences between your bird song sing-alongs and birdsong that is incorporated into formalised or ritual singing that involves mimicry? Um, formalised... Um, mm, I probably have to have a bit of a think about that one, <laughs> David. Um, 
But I guess part of my work is that it is imp um, improvising. I'm asking people to participate on the spur of the moment. So there's not the, the thought involved as such, although, I mean, I'm introducing certain ideas. Um, I mean, often these these projects that I do are sort of longer workshops and you're we're out in the space in which these uh, say the birds are voicing and we hear the birds at the same time as we're trying to voice them. So it's um, it's a kind of immersion in the way that this can't be, um, but this is its own sort of experimental setting, which is which is good. Um, but I think it's. Um, I have tried to I have done some performances with performers um, not necessarily trained performers, but people who are willing to perform rather than invite audiences to participate. And in a sense, there's something, there's just that less, um, uh, what's the word, je ne sais quoi, there's a less um, of a grit or a grist in that setting rather than this, which is uncomfortable. People feel self-conscious, but again, humour helps with that. It's like, well, just laugh. Laughing, perhaps our laughter sounds more like a, a bird than our, our spoken words. So um, it's something to do with uh, not having that preparation that is quite uh, key, I guess, to, to the reason they're participatory um, uh, voicings which is my preference than um, planned or prepared or performances as such. Um, that might answer your question. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and we have another question from Sonia Lieber. Um, Nori, the work that you showed, The Waiting with Worms, was cited at the border of the home and the garden. How important is this in terms of implicating we humans um, as urban dwellers. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, I think really it's Sonia's made a good point there. But, yeah, I mean, place is something that we've always been interested in with our work, so... You know, sometimes we do these works where we don't even notice what we're doing until we've done it. So looking back at it, you know, I can see, you can see the house behind us, which we didn't actually pay that much attention to when we made the video. I mean, as you can see, we didn't even dress properly. I mean, sometimes we just get this urge to go out there and do something, and then we notice afterwards, oh, this is where it was placed, and that actually makes a big difference to what it is. And you can hear the birds in our garden behind us. So, yeah, it was very much um, in a sort of overlapping space, I suppose. Or however, I can't remember exactly what you just said, Sonia, but, yeah, I, I think that's a good perception of it. Mm. Well, we're actually out of time, so... I think we should probably wrap up, but thanks to both of you so much for such a stimulating and entertaining um, <laughs> session. Um, so please stay tuned, everybody, for talk number three at 3 p.m. And in the meantime, we'll continue to screen the Rockpool Dialogues by Dirk Bruyne, Jordan Lacey, and Michael Grave.